they speak to fishermen, hunters, uh, you know, the ranch and rodeo crowd. They're big into barbecue outdoors. So you have uh, rock climbers and, you know, river raft guides and, and all kinds of people, snowboarders, skiers. Um, and the, I, I think the biggest difference for us is, is Coast is pretty much just a fishing company. So our, our one community that we really, really focus on and drive home is, is the, the fishermen and anglers, yeah. That was Evan Russell describing a subtle difference between two iconic brands in fishing. Yeti Costa and the people behind the brands today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. If you are brand new to the podcast, uh, take a second here, stop and click that subscribe button uh, in the app of choice you're using. If that is Apple Podcasts, it's actually a follow now. Click that little plus sign in the upper right corner of your app. And that'll get uh, you notified next time our uh, new episode goes live. Evan Russell is here to help us understand what goes into sunglasses and how you can select your next uh, pair of glasses. Evan talks about the most popular lenses for fishing, whether glass or plastic is better and some of the features there and some of the other important factors that may help you understand glasses just a little bit better. Before we get started, let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get your custom net today. Let's jump into it and see how this one turns out. Without further ado, here is Evan Russell from Costa. How's it going, Evan? Good, Dave. Yeah, it's nice, man. We're here in Austin, Texas, and uh, it's a nice, like, I think it's like 53, so enjoying the fall weather. Yeah. There you go. Oh, so 53, that's right. 53 is cool for you guys. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a nice change of pace. Yeah, we've had a number of, uh, oh, we've had a lot of, uh, Texas, the more we do this, the more Texas is kind of a hot spot for us, and, you know, we've had a number of guests down there, and so we're going to dig in probably not as much on the fly fishing, although we'll probably touch on that today, but we're going to dig into Costa, yeah, sure. Costa, what you have going, but talk about how you first, uh, just quickly, how you first got into fly fishing, and then how you brought that into working for uh, for Costa. Sure, yeah, so... So I grew up in Florida, um, a lot of inshore, offshore saltwater fishing there and, um, went to, uh, university of central Florida and, um, about an hour from there is a mosquito lagoon, um, which is, you know, used to be an incredible red fishery. And, and unfortunately the, um, a lot of the, a lot of the seagrass is gone and, and it doesn't hold as many fish as it used to. But when I was in college, um, I would probably, I would go over there a couple of days a week. I was part of the UCF fishing club. And, um, we had, uh, we basically got a grant from the college. They, each club got a little bit of money. We had some funds raised and we had a bunch of, um, uh, fishing kayaks. So we were able to, um, rent those and go over there. I went over there with my buddy, Matt Norman, a couple of days a week and had a, had a blast and, you know, on days we didn't have class. And so kind of got into fly fishing that way, I guess, probably, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago. Um, didn't, you know, that, this I grew up in Fort Pierce, Florida, and the, there wasn't a ton of fly fishing there. A little bit of tarpon off the beach, but kind of you know I kind of did what my my dad and my parents did, and we did a lot of sail fishing and and bottom fishing, and you know snook and red fish and shore, um, you know conventional tackle. But yeah, so kind of kind of fell into that, and um, it was funny. I my, my friend Matt that I mentioned earlier, we we when we would be driving over, he was working part time at West Marine um at the time and we were both kind of joking about like like how do we turn this passion of ours and in, into a career and we both uh got super lucky he works for a uh, use you know he he went to work for hell's bay boat works after college and i wound up working for a boat company as well and then uh got into kind of the publishing scene so i worked for um bonnier corporation so uh, saltwater sportsman, sport fishing, marlin. Um, at the time when I first started, they had fly fishing in saltwater magazine um, as well, and uh, kind of worked there for for a while, and um, landed at Yeti um, for the last five years, and then uh, recently been with Costa right out a year now. So um, and yeah, so we're brought us out to Austin, Texas, and and we're actually planning on moving back to Florida here 
this winter. So, um, and, and being with COSA kind of gives us a, a great opportunity to do that being a Florida based company. And, um, yeah, so it's been, I feel super fortunate to have kind of landed in the industry at some really great companies and, and kind of get a PhD in marketing, you know? So it's, uh, it's kind of, you know, Right, right, right. That's an, and I, th- I think as we have time, we might dig into a little bit of the marketing stuff uh, at the end, just because there's yeah, a lot sure. of, a lot of brands that listen to this as well. But I'm curious. So, which species, when you were down there in the the lagoon, um, which were you chasing mainly back in the day? Yeah, so mainly redfish. Um, yeah, a lot of ton of redfish and, and some big big trout. Um, you know, flounder now and then, and then some. Uh, and there's some like back creeks and, and little ponds and stuff that had some baby tarpon in them there too so gotcha no it's cool i i i recently um we had steve davis from the everglades foundation on he did oh whole, awesome yeah yeah cool yeah he did a deep dive into uh the all the stuff they have going which is amazing you know the, it's like a huge project like 16 billion i think he said it's the largest restoration project in history of the world or right it so is yep giant thing yeah. and uh so i love it so um i'll put a link to the show notes to that so people can take a look um and then yeah just you know it's interesting hearing about the story for me because these brand stories we talked to a lot of people that are on all ends of it and i know the yeti story is pretty cool um but yeah I, i'd love to hear this the costa maybe you could just start us off before we dig into sunglasses and talk about sure yeah. you know what i mean like what, what tell us give us the little uh, costa how, how did this company because it became now it's like a leader but was it always leading like it like it is yeah so you know i think a lot of um a lot of these companies that you know kind of take a, a an existing product and elevate them uh, are kind of born out of frustration, like of something that doesn't exist currently. Right. Um, or something that's not quite cutting it. So, um, COSA was, was founded in 1983 by a gentleman named Ray Ferguson. And, um, he was a avid fisherman and him and his buddies just were kind of looking for something to, to help. And they, you know, polarization technology was just starting to come out and figured how do we translate this into sunglasses and, and make a, you know, make a killer product. So they've, you know, been around for quite a while. Uh, next year, I guess 2023 will be our 40th anniversary. Oh, wow. God, it's amazing. Yeah. Which is crazy. Yeah. In a, so in, uh, in the early two thousands, um, Costa became kind of what it is today and what it's known for is the 580 glass lens. So that's when they came out with the 580 technology, um, which cuts light at certain nanometers. Um, and so, and that's what, that's kind of what the bread and butter and why COSA is what it is today is because of that. And it, you know, just the, the clarity and the quality um, of them. So that technology has been around, I think what, 18, I don't, I guess 18 to 20 years now. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of funny because we, we, with the product team, we were trying to kind of top that and we had some prototype lenses. Um, actually I wasn't working for a company at the time, but, uh, I had a buddy named Todd who um, we were tarpon fishing in Apalachicola and he brought some testers and we're like, man, these aren't quite, a, you know, aren't quite as good. So trying to kind of top that and haven't been able to yet. So um, yeah, which is crazy. So no kidding. Give us, or somebody doesn't know anything about the tech, what is 580 and why was that so important at the time? So it basically filters uh, light out at the 580 nanometers. Um, so it helps with, um, it basically cuts the it like cuts out we're not technically allowed to say cuts out bad light but oh right uh, i light light that doesn't enhance um your like optical clarity and it depends right and so you have the light spectrum and this and basically i'm trying to think i would love to include a chart for you guys well that's the thing this might be easier because first i got a couple questions maybe think about if there's a place that we could send somebody right now just to understand more yeah definitely yeah that would be one thing so we have that, yeah, we have a link on our site for that. Um, and it kind of explains that and, and it has the graph chart of, of all the, uh, like the color spectrum and it kind of shows you where it starts to cut it out. Okay. And who would be a person like, do you know somebody who's like the nerdiest glass person, you know, around that knows all this techie stuff? Do you guys have like kind of like scientists and stuff like that on your, on the staff? Yeah. So we have, yeah, we, a lot of our product team is, uh, super well versed in all this and and even Jess Bryant from our um product team knows it very well. Okay. 
Um, but yeah, John Sanchez, Casey Lopez on our team, uh, product guys. There, gotcha. I mean, they can really, really dig in. You could probably do a whole podcast on that. Yeah, that would be. Yeah, I think. I think today <laughs> what we'll technology, do technology. You know exactly. So. Yeah, I think today what we'll do is dig into more of like maybe understanding choosing glasses, some basic stuff, and then we'll leave that for maybe another one if we could dig into it. Yeah, um, I was absolutely. also curious who is just walk us through. So we're talking a forty year old company who now is running the show there, and what's that look like? Yeah. So. Um, trying to think from a um as far as who's running the show from your perspective like what um yeah like like what do you like i'm not sure if you guys have i i'm just kind of uh, you know <laughs> not too smart on all this stuff i mean is, do you have one like ceo who's running things is that kind of the uh, or like yeah so actually so yeah in 2019 we um we kind of merged into Luxotica, um which is a a big um big sunglass brand i wear um you know kind of oh wow how do you spell that yeah so it's l-u-x-o-t-t-i-c-a okay and um <clears throat> and so they they're the parent company of ray-ban oakley oh wow um, Persol, yeah all those and so we're um so we have a our, our corporate um we have corporate headquarters in new york but our like main organization is in milan italy and we're uh so we're still based in florida um, and then we have, you know, employees, the coast employees are, are kind of all, uh, all, all over the country. We have, I'm, I'm in Austin. We have employees in Florida. Um, you know, a lot of our team is spread out. We have, uh, Justice and Bozeman. Some of our guys are in California. Um, when one of our guys is in, in Charleston, so we're kind of all over the place. Um, but yeah, so we have, you know, we have the CEO of Luxottica and then that trickles down to, um, we have the, uh, the, the president of North America. And then we have the uh, senior VP of North America who um, is, his name is Justin Cubs and he kind of uh, oversees Oakley and coast the business for North America. So, yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is a huge, yeah, this is, I mean, I'm not sure how many people are involved in the, the company, but this is a probably, I mean, I'm not sure if it's the biggest, but one of the big, uh, so, and, and Luxottica is definitely mm-hmm. massive owning uh, Ray-Ban and some other ones. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's kind of, you know, it's been an interesting transition in, in the fact that, you know, it ha- kind of happened. Transitions are always, or integrations, if you will, are kind of always bumpy. And then you throw COVID in the mix. Oh, and right. and um, so it's tough, you know, and people aren't in person. So everybody's trying to do everything remote, yeah. but it's been good. And our product's gotten um, better. Our technology's gotten a little bit better too, because we can pull from some of our, our sister brands and, um, you know, our, like Oakley's R and D facility is incredible. And we get to use a lot of their like 3d printers and, uh, some, some of their, their kind of things that they have in their back pocket. So it's been a cool transition. And then a lot of our products are, um, are made in America. Um, now, I mean, most of them are, you know, where, which is, they're, you know, made in California, which is, which is pretty cool. So, there you go. So there's some good, uh, probably yeah. some good and some bad. Yeah, definitely some good things coming out of that. Yeah, and, and I wouldn't even say bad, just kind of unknowns at the time. And then over the last two years, um, you know, I, I once you figure out internally who you need to speak with and um, kind of, you know, just just the processes and procedures. It's, I mean, we're I think we're full steam ahead now and in a really good spot. So. Okay, perfect. Well, let's uh, let's dig in. I'm going to save some of the uh, the marketing, uh, you know, questions if we have time for the end. But let's dig into just some basics on glasses because, sure. you know, I think that's where I initially connected um, to Hannah, and we were talking, and you know, I I was in the market for some new glasses. I've had you know been wearing some old ones and things like that. But so it was interesting going through that process, right? Looking for a new pair of glasses. Where I know you guys probably, I know you do have information on your website, but where do you start somebody when they say they, they come in and they say, okay, I want to get a new pair of glasses. Is it just, do you start with lenses or do you start with frames? What, what do you start with? Yeah. So, um, I would say the first thing would be, I would start with frames because you want people to have a good experience and have comfort out on the water. And especially when if you're fishing, you know, eight, 10, 12 hour days, you want them to be bearable for that long and be comfortable and them to have a good experience. So I would start with frames. And then I think, you know, we have six base frames and eight base frames and six base frames are, are more flat, um, which would be more lifestyle frames like the Spiro, um, the Rincon that kind of, you know, they, they can be used on the water, but they have a flatter base. Um, so they're more lifestyle. And then our eight base frames are some of our, best sellers and kind of what started with the brand is and they have more wrap on them so they have more coverage on the side of your eyes let less light in 
what do you think is the um, you just from a fishing perspective? I know we have salt and freshwater, but what do you think is the most popular uh, frame you guys sell sure. for like fly fishermen or just fishing in general? Our number one selling frame right now is the Reefton. How do you spell that? R e e f t o n. Okay. And so we have um, the Reefton's our best selling frame this year. Some of our really really good sellers uh, for fishing in general have been our um, our Pro series. So. Basically, we took frames that we had that have been kind of in the lineup for a, a while and, and revamped them. So we have um, the Fantail Pro and the Blackfin Pro. And so we still have the regular Blackfin and, and the regular Fantail, but these new frames um, have uh, six new features. They have adjustable nose pads, sweat channels, a hooding over the top of the, top of the eyes to block more light, um, metal keeper slots for retainers. They're just, yeah, they're great. And, and so those have been some of the top sellers this year as well. And those are both eight base. Okay. So. Perfect. And what about glass? When you talk about the the glass itself, I mean, yeah. what about glass versus plastic? Are there any, is plastic, I mean, is still a decent if you get a high quality or, or is glass the way to go? Yeah. So specifically for fishing, um, you know, either will work and either, you know, both are great polarized um, options, but uh, I think, I specifically fish in glass um, and, and some of the benefits of that are optical clarity is just as hair better. And then you have, uh, and they're a, a more scratch resistant as well. So if you're getting, getting salt water on them, or even if you're, you know, even if you're fishing fresh water and, and, you know, you wiping, you know, wiping stuff off with a towel in the boat or like something that you might have, you know, some sediment on it or something, you know, it's, it's a lot more scratch resistant. Um, is it heavier? Yeah, it's a little it's tad heavier. So you can definitely um, notice a difference. And that's why the frame selection is pretty important when you're picking glass lenses too, because you want them to be, they're not, you know, much heavier, but you just want them to be comfortable. And so when you have, and then the poly is uh, more impact resistant, um, you know, a little bit lighter. Do you guys make a poly? Yeah. So yeah. So the poly is basically the 580p. So it's the plastic. Gotcha. So it's the plastic versus glass. Yeah. And on, from a price perspective, is is the plastic typically cheaper than glass? So, yeah, typically about fifty bucks. Fifty bucks. And what yeah. about the lens color? If you're if you're talking, you know, you got the blue, the green, you got the amber. I mean, what is? Let, let's take it to again. Let's let's start with the most popular. What is for fishing? What is the most popular? And I know you have salt and freshwater, but what would you say there? Sure, I would say our most uh, popular lenses are amber based, and so which would usually be the green mirror. Um, so we have the green mirror, which is an amber base. We have an amber, no mirror, um, as well. And then we have a uh, copper silver mirror. Um, but I would say our, the green mirrors for fishermen in general is probably the green mirror. Does that, uh, is that good for salt and freshwater? Yeah, it's great for both. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's probably why, cause it has so many applications. So, oh, so many, yeah. Okay. And I was just thinking I've, I've used a pair of amber lenses for years and they're, like I said, my old glasses, they're really great there. I think they're even plastic. I can't remember the name of the, the brand. I think that they might have been um, uh, SunCloud. SunCloud. Okay, you know, yeah. I'm not sure if you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sure. SunCloud. I'm not even sure the history of SunCloud or whatever, but but they were super light. Um, they are a little scratched up. They got scratched up, but they were. I loved them because they were so light and they were just kind of like, I don't know, just easy and they fit. They were pretty a wrap, but it was amber and I always liked amber. But you're saying, how does Green Mirror compare to, say, that amber lens? Yeah, so it has a... So it has a copper base, so it's it's close to the amber spectrum. Um, so with that, you have the um, copper slash amber highlight. It accentuates contrast, right? So and and that's the best thing for fish spotting when you're sight fishing. Oh, there you go. Yep. So that's it. Yep. Yep. So that's it. So so now we're getting down to it. I mean, glasses, a good quality lens is basically, especially for salt, where you're trying to find fish, but. If you're if you're in an area where maybe you're not spotting fish or it's not critical, maybe you don't need that the super high quality lens necessarily. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, something to be said for high quality lenses too is optical clarity for other things. Whether you know whether it be in, um, I'm trying to think like not specifically sight fishing, but you know, it's something to be said for a good pair of glasses for your eye protection as far as light coming in and you know different spectrums on that and. You know, and there's a lot of great manufacturers out there, but there's something to be said, you know, versus even, you know, if you were to go with a different brand, it's better, like a high quality 
pair of glasses, whether it be plastic or, or glass, is you know infinitely better for your eye health over a you know say twenty dollar pair you could find at Walmart or whatever, even though they're both polarized. So. So that's the problem. That's probably my problem. I've been going with the cheaper glasses, and probably yeah. that's probably the reason I'm wearing glasses now for for reading. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. I don't know. That's it. All yeah. right. Well, let's uh, let, let's think. So on the polarize, this is another interesting thing because obviously polarize is huge again uh, for water being able to cut the glare. What um, I'm curious, you know, when you have your glasses on, you're walking around town. You have that thing where you know if you're looking straight, you have polarized, and then if you turn your head sideways, the polarization kind of goes away. What um, uh, I'm not even sure the tech why that happens, but are there glasses that are polarized where it doesn't do that? Where because the, it's kind of hard actually when you're looking at your phone, right? Because you have that glare. Yeah, sure. You, ever, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, definitely. And that's the thing too. You think about with polarized glasses, and I've I've experienced this with um, multiple brands where you know if you're like trying to go outside uh, and work on your laptop, you can't see the screen, no, and, and vice versa. Exactly. Yeah, and then some. You know, it's funny with some like. It seems to be Toyota specifically, but the screens in the trucks mm. are hard to see uh, at certain angles with with polarized. Um, with polarized glasses on. Yeah, and I don't know if it's just the way that like it the way they're built with it. It's just like maybe the screen's flatter than in some other vehicles. I don't know, but that's you know it's kind of a double edged sword. I think um, ours do a really good job of you know you have pretty good with the wrap um, and, and even six and eight base. You have pretty good optical clarity throughout. Uh, you know, if you get into the edges, maybe, but it seems to be kind of the case with most polarization. It is. Yeah. You can't get away from that. It's just going to make it harder to look if you can't really go outdoor and look at a screen that cleanly. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Uh, that gives us a take there and just gives us feedback on, you know, the glasses cost wise, you know, obviously glasses, like you said, can range from 20 bucks up to hundreds of dollars. What is the biggest thing? I mean, as far as the, is it the tech? Is it just the lens that makes these glasses more expensive or speak a little bit to that? Sure. Yeah. So, um, I think for us, it's the whole technology package as far as, you know, build quality lenses, frames, the frames, um, the frames are, you know, well thought out and try and use the best materials possible. Um, and so, you know, it's, we're kind of in line with a lot of other premium sunglass manufacturers as far as price goes, um, you know, and, and from a perspective of poly versus glass, you know, that, that's kind of our, the poly is, is a little bit of our cheaper offering, which kind of is kind of an introduction into the brand, if you will. And then something that's cool too, is we have actually just launched our Untangled 2.0, collection this past spring and so our untangled which is they're uh, made from recycled fishing nets they are actually our cheapest glass offering which is kind of cool so they're 226 um versus you know some of our other glass frames are you know 279 gotcha so those are glass so the untangled series is the that's the frame is made of recycled like ocean plastic correct yep yeah so uh, fishing yeah recycled fishing nets they're a company called Boreo. They have a, a program where they um, basically have, you know, a lot of people think that they're just derelict nets that are kind of floating in the ocean that are recovered. But what they've done which is super cool is they have a program where um, fishermen in South America can basically turn in their old fishing nets instead of leaving them in the ocean and, and get kind of a kickback for that. And then they basically um, strip those down and then turn them into uh, its nylon pellets, and then the pellets can be melted down into injection molding. Oh wow! There you go. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so as we think of this, you know, we've gone over some general stuff on glass, and glasses aren't, you know, when you think about it, it's not like a super technical product. I mean, it's just glasses. But anything else we want to be thinking about if we're somebody's coming in here and they need a new pair of glasses, you know, what else? Any other, um, you know, tips or resources? Anything that you would recommend they they dig into? Sure. Yeah, so I like we t- kind of touched on earlier, fit is kind of imperative. And if you're fishing specifically, I'd recommend an eight base frame because it has more coverage, so it blocks that light out. You know, you think about you have, you know, say Sims and whoever else, even our Costa hats. Like you, you try and block out as much light as possible, so even the hats, you know, have the black brim under underneath. And so it's effectively that for your eyes, like kind of keeping out as much light. And that's kind of enemy because it creates more glare. You know, it, it's a distraction. Um, so fit eight base. And then, um, yeah, and then, I, you know, I would steer people. 
I think poly is great and our poly lenses are fantastic, but if it's fish specifically, I would steer towards glass just from a, a durability standpoint. And, you know, and, and then it goes down to lens color. We have so many different lens colors, but if, you know, I, I get asked a lot, you know, think about maybe people who work for Costa, uh, professional captains and guides, you know, their, their tools, uh, sunglasses are, are kind of a, a tool, uh, for them to, to catch more fish and have more pleasant days on the water. So a lot of us have multiple pairs of sunglasses. So we're able to have different fits, different lens colors, all that. But if the question, like I said, get, that I get asked all the time is like, Hey, you know, they're expensive. So if I'm only buying one pair, what color lens do I want? You know? And I would say kind of like we touched on earlier, the green mirror, copper, silver mirror are, are both great for that. And kind of like, they're, they're good experience all around, whether you're on the water, driving your car, um, anything in it, and it creates a lot more contrast, but keeps a good amount of light out as well. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. And there, and I know there's some stuff, some techie stuff we're leaving on the table, but we'll, maybe we'll leave it to uh, folks if they want to connect uh, to Costa, we can put a, maybe find somebody or a, or a resource where they can learn more about. Yeah, sure. No, I'd be happy to. Okay. Yeah. And I'm happy to answer some of those questions as well, but yeah, we'll, I mean, we can definitely, you know, we, like I said, there's so much information and, and technology that goes into it that we, yeah, we could have a whole other hour oh, talk yeah. just on that. You know, so. no, totally. And I, and I'm thinking, you know, I had a pair of glasses, you know, that, uh, you know, I tried them on and I thought they were good. And then after wearing them for like a, a month, I realized I was getting like a red mark on my nose because the glasses, mm -hmm. I, I just think didn't fit. So I guess one tip might be to, uh, I guess when you can't go into, I mean, you probably don't want to be buying these things online. You probably want to go in and get a fit. How, what would you recommend there? Because you don't know. all. Yeah. Though. Yeah. No, great question. I would 1000% recommend visiting a local retailer. We have kind of minimized adver advertised pricing. So, all you know, if you buy it on the site versus a retailer, you're going to pay the same. Um, so there's really no benefit to, you know, my, our e-com team is probably going to get a hold of this and be like, what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, our, you know, our dealers are bread and butter and, and those people are trained and they can help you. And, um, fit is so subjective too, right? We have, we do the best we can on our site with, um, fit wise, you know, it gives you measurements. It has, a you know, a lens, uh, fit and frame width fit. Like, you know, it's from everything from small to large. So it kind of gets you close. But if you have an opportunity and there's, you know, some, there's some areas that the nearest dealers, you know, 50 miles, so it might be a pain. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's an investment, right? So if you're, if you're spending that much money on a pair of sunglasses, I highly recommend try them on. Yeah. Try them um, first. In, in person. Yeah. yeah. And something that's cool with like our pro series that I, I mentioned earlier and, um, that's translating some of our other frames. Uh, we have the Ferg frame as well they have adjustable nose pads on them. So you can kind of customize the fit to a certain degree, which is kind of nice. So, you know, having those, um, having the ability and, and, you know, what made me think of that was you, you saying the red mark on your nose. And so the, there's a handful of frames that we have that you can adjust the nose pad on to, oh, you know, customize bad. that fit for you. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And I was just looking at a few other tips. Uh, I think this is from like an REI article on uh, sunglasses, but it says, you know, a few little bullet tips. Frames should fit snugly on your nose and ears, but not pinch. I mean, some obvious stuff. Uh, the weight should be evenly distributed to your ear and nose. Frames should be light enough to avoid friction. You know, another obvious one. Your eyelashes should not contact the frame. You know, yeah, that, that makes for sure. that's pretty. And then, uh, and then there's a couple other little ones here as far as, and they note here adjusting the nose piece as well. So, it, um, and so yeah, there's a ton of stuff. I'll link out to that article and some other info there. Yeah, and there's some good tips on that too, because you know, fit creates, like you said, you want to you want to block out as much light as possible. But also, if the fit is too tight, you know, we have we've introduced a lot of a lot of features, venting, and all kinds of stuff, and especially with the adjustable nose pad to uh, create less fog situations. But you know, sometimes if if the wrap's too tight and they're not, you know, and and you might think they fit, but uh, you know, if a retailer has, has a trained, um, salesperson on the floor, they might be able to help you with that as well with, okay, those are a little too tight and you can, you know, if, if and, and create some fog in there, but a lot of our new frames have, um, things to prevent that in certain vents and, you know, with the adjustable nose pads, you can bend them enough to set, like have the frame sit a little bit off of your face. So there, you know, so that, that doesn't happen. 
And now let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Stonefly starts the design process by selecting wood for the handle based on a number of key factors, including grain pattern and depth, but they don't stop there. This piece of art is accentuated by strips of hardwood that complement and accentuate the handcrafted handle. To be honest, I have never been a huge net guy, mainly because I didn't feel like my uh, old collapsible net was easiest to use and was not easy on the eye, if you know what I mean. The Stonefly uh, net not only looks beautiful, but has high quality netting that is easy on the fish and will last for years to come. Stonefly's goal is to create a unique custom classic wood net that's second to none and can be customized for a little extra touch. When Ethan designs a custom net, it's his hope that others will create amazing lasting memories for years to come. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get your custom net now. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly, S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y, to get started right now. Okay, let's get back to the show. So you've worked for uh, two different companies. You worked for Yeti, and and now you're with Costa. It seems like Costa is a, a much bigger, older company. Uh, Yeti is a younger company. Talk about the difference between the two companies. I'm sure there's some, and I'm thinking more focus on maybe somebody listening that wants to understand a little bit about, you know, maybe they have a brand and they want to hear some successes, what they could do. Think about it. So what is the big difference? Yeah, sure. So. You know, actually, funny enough, so Coast is an older company, but revenue wise, like Yeti has just been an absolute rocket ship. So oh, no they're, they've kind of eclipsed them from from a Coast standpoint, you know, like Zotica, the greater organization is bigger, but gotcha. the brand uh, revenue wise is, is less than Yeti. But yeah, so the differences between the brands, there's a lot of similarities. It's kind of, you know, we, we focus a lot on community marketing. So um, grassroots level stuff, sponsoring tournaments you know, making sure we're at events, kind of one those one-on-one interactions with captains and guides and other organizations. And so, you know, in both companies, we focus in, in at Yeti and, and at Costa focus a lot on conservation. So, you know, if we don't preserve the resource, then we don't have a, you know, our consumer is that, that person. And so if we don't preserve the resource, there's no reason to go outside anymore. And so, you know, that's, that might be taken a little far, but you know, you got to kind of like stay true to your roots. And I think both companies have done a, a great job of that. Like, like you can, you can welcome new people into the brand and talk to new audiences, but you can't forget where you came from and, and who kind of, who were your original core consumers and, and kind of who uh, helped you get to where you're going. So, you know, that's been a big play. The community th- piece is huge. Um, and that's kind of what the team that I've worked on in both companies is community marketing. Um, with Yeti, there's such a broad reach to, you know, with fishing, they speak to fishermen, hunters, uh, the ranch and rodeo crowd. They're big into barbecue, outdoor. So you have uh, rock climbers and river guy, you know, river raft guides and, and all kinds of people, snowboarders, skiers. Um, and the, I, I think the biggest difference for us is, is Coast is pretty much just a fishing company. So our, our one community that we really, really focus on and drive home is, is the, the fishermen and anglers. Yeah. No kidding. So it's all a fishing. That's the one thing I was curious about. So yeah, I didn't realize it was such a fishing focus. So you don't have, I mean, even though they're sunglasses, you're really not, your target market is not just the general public as much. Yeah. And, and, you know, we'd love the general public to, to latch onto our brand, but yeah, the, the people we speak to are, are pretty much anglers and, you know, we do, and I would say anglers and watermen, right? So you, you have our spear, uh, spear fishermen and women, um, kind of our, our surfing crowd, and then, you know, we're kind of, we're talking about how to, how to expand that market in an authentic way. Um, and how do we go about that aspirationally and speak to new people? You know, like I said, I, we would love to sell to anybody that, that finds our brand interesting and our product great. And so something that's kind of um, introduced our product more to the masses is uh, Luxottica owns um, Sunglass Hut. And so all of our, our products are in Sunglass Hut now, which, you know, so when you're an you know, everyday consumer and you go into Sunglass Hut in a mall or something and, and are trying on glasses, you know, our product is there to compare to all the other brands they carry as well, um, which is kind of cool. So there you go. That's awesome. I was in, interested. The um, You mentioned the community marketing and that's something 
I think is sounds like something that's been pretty helpful for you uh, as a brand. What, what, now, describe that. What, what is community? Is it more than just going to events? What, what does community marketing exactly mean? Yeah, so community marketing is kind of all encompassing of the community. So there's so many touch points, like I said, with with events, conservation efforts, even uh, the media piece. There's you know even doing things like this, like you know podcasts, talking to, to folks in the industry. So it's marketing specifically to the people who um, kind of buy your product and, and will help grow your brand by word of mouth. So if from the fishing community, we want to support everything they do from A to Z and, and initiatives that are important to them, whether it be, uh, you know, sponsoring a sailfish tournament or, you know, and then sh- actually showing up at that sailfish tournament instead of just stroking a check, but, you know, being there, shaking hands, h- helping people with warranty issues, right. uh, you know, sponsoring a bar tab or something for everybody to wind down at the end of the day, you know, so it's kind of, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of facets to it. And, um, that's basically about engaging, engaging. Exactly. Yeah. It's the one-on-one interaction, right? So we do these like uh, guide rendezvous, and and so you know we'll sponsor a couple of days for guides to come, kind of kick back and relax, and and you know sponsor helpful things for them, whether it be uh, you know having an accountant come speak on how to do your taxes a little better as a fishing guide, and uh, you know kind of bringing up topics and uh, things that are important to them about licensing and all this. So it's just kind of like, yeah, it, it's a grassroots marketing one-on-one interaction so it's like you're um it's kind of like a guerrilla marketing but not really you know it's more like where you're actually sponsoring you're paying for some yeah some, instead of paying for a it google ad is. instead of paying for a google ad you're paying for sponsoring a local event which is awesome yeah exactly it's essentially what we do at the podcast you know when we when we bring new sponsors on the podcast a big part of what we do is saying you know we say hey let's just not work, think about this as an ad thing this is let's think about a cool activation we can create that really engages our listener with the brand right so if we were working with you guys yeah that's exactly you know right. what i mean that's the whole thing because people that are listening right now you know the worst thing to be is to be boring right and just be like some run of the mill but if you can create something that actually is engaging and helpful to somebody then they're much more likely to check it out so that sounds like that's kind of where you guys are at yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so you spend a lot of time in that. And, and you know, that's a thing as we grow, you know, we're so heavy in the Southeast and, and gained a lot of traction in the Northeast now and out, out on the West Coast. And, and we need to work on the Great Lakes area. And, and so you sponsor and, and I wouldn't even say sponsor, right? You support things that are important to the people in that region, you know, kind of the go to events and the you know, just even just the guides and, and create programs, you you can support conservation efforts in their area to make sure that they can keep fishing and, and all that. So it's kind of, and it, you know, it takes a, it's a lot of effort. We have a decent sized team for that. And we, you know, we're, we're hiring some folks now too. And, and as we grow, you know, you, it's important to be present in those areas. So we have a, a gentleman named Bob Hoos, who um, is our California community leader and he's done such a great job out there making sure we show up at every event and supporting people and you know kind of carrying on the brand message there and so the more people see you the more they associate your brand with environment like the fishing environment so so that that when you know somebody goes to a surf shop and they can buy a pair of smiths a pair of costas uh, you know von zipper electric whatever they're like, oh, like Costa's shown up. I've seen the van. Like I've, you know, met Bob. Like I'm going to, you know, all these glasses cost about the same. So I'm going to go with them, you know? So that's it. Yeah. It's just getting out there. No, it makes, it makes total sense. So, well, and I think today, uh, uh, Evan, we're not going to have time to dig into fully to the brand stuff. And we ha- actually have another podcast that I do, which is more focused on online marketing for outdoor brands. So I think that yeah. might be a good chance. Maybe we could talk down the line if there was any sure. interest. Yeah. And, and digging in more because yeah, I think this topic, great. like we said, there's a bunch of, companies and brands that love hearing it when we dig and i know there's some people listening that aren't that don't have companies and i think we hopefully served them with the the initial part of this but i'm just curious if you give us as we kind of think about starting to take this out just one tip for that brand so somebody's listening from a marketing perspective we've talked a little bit about but what would you tell them if they're they got a newer brand maybe they've got a you know maybe it's a new glass company or a rod company or something like that any tip you would give them to help them kind of uh move the needle a little bit oh man uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, um, that's definitely, I love to put you on the spot there, Evan. So thank you. No, I love it. it. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think, you know, I think you can't forget 
the brand vision. Like you can't, uh, I'm trying to think like stay true to your roots, no matter what. And like I said earlier, like you can always, so whatever your initial goal for the brand was stick to that. And you can welcome people into the sport or the brand, you know, but don't forget what kind of that initial spark and fire was. Um, and, and kind of, yeah, just, just don't lose your way. That's like amazing. there's so many things that get thrown at, at us all the time. Right. And you gotta, if you kind of focus on what you're good at and then the rest will kind of fall into place. So, you know, if you're a product company, um, you know, there's a lot of companies out there that are marketing companies that sell a product and they do an incredible job because they market really well. And there's a lot of product companies that, um, you know, like if you focus on building a really good product and then, market it pretty well like that'll you know you'll you'll gain a lot of interest word of mouth is probably right even though all the stuff we talk about if you if you have a sweet product even without marketing you hear about these things all the time right brands that don't do much marketing also they just kick off and and then but when you do well in the marketing and you have a good product that's kind of that's it right exactly yeah And, and you know from a product standpoint build the best you can have a good warranty uh customer service is key i mean you kind of see how I don't know if you know much about Chewy. Oh, no. um, uh-uh. dot com, but like, gosh, Chewy dot com is like a, it's such a cool customer service um, story. Yeah, <laughs> don't tell me what this is. I'm just gonna. I have no idea. Yeah. So this is, and this, I'm guessing this, this isn't a dog treat thing. No, it is. So, oh, it is. Oh, nice. Yeah, so they they did good on their marketing, I guess. They sell. They yeah. They sell. Uh, you know, a lot of companies do as well, but they sell. Um, they sell dog food and dog medicines and cat food, you know, all animal stuff, but they just like have done, like you get a handwritten card, like they send flowers. If your pet passes oh, wow. away, like wow. you can get a hold of them within two minutes on a phone or chat or anything. Like it's, it's such a cool company. You know, it's like those things make you want to buy the product because of that. Service. Um, you know, so it's, yeah, it's service. Exactly. And it's just a, you got to have something that differentiates your brand from the, all the others and whether it be, you know, there's five, there's say there's 10 roto motor cooler companies out there. Why is Yeti better? There's coast of sunglasses. There's a ton of sunglasses out there, but why, you know, why would you buy that? And it's because these brands care about what you believe in. They care about uh, kind of what you do as a, as kind of a pursuit um, and they support that, you know? And so, um, and that's kind of the differentiator you got to have that. What is that? I'm just curious, put you on the spot again, the, the vision <laughs> uh, yeah. of Costa, you know, or, or, or the mission or whatever. I mean, what, when you think of it, it sounds like, you know, my guess is you're obviously focused on the fly fishing industry. So it's all about, you know, like you said, conservation and providing the best products, but is there a, like a broader vision there? For, yeah, Costa is a brand. So I think it's, you know, our, our tagline, see what's out there. Right. So we, create the way I like to kind of equate it to is it it enhances your outdoor experience through comfort, uh, vision, um, you know, and your, your connection to the outside world is by what, what you see through your eyes. Right. And so that's your experience. And so if we can elevate that and, uh, you know, I like to say it still blows me away to this day. Our, our, and I'm not just saying this because I work, I would tell you this if I didn't work for Costa, the experience with them, the, the clarity and quality of the lenses is just so far above and beyond. Like you think, like I'm thinking about when I first had my experience with them growing up when I was a teenager, you know, and and had a pair. And then now, like even to this day, like I'll put them on and go outside and like you say, it's like fall right now. Right. So there's a lot of like vibrant colors and stuff and it just enhances everything. It's like, uh, it's like polarization plus, right? right? Like it just, it's like HD vision for, you know, what made you, if you go back to that seven or whatever, your teenage years, what, what made you, cause I'm sure they weren't cheap then. Why did you buy Costa then? Yeah, exactly. You know, it's funny. I had my, uh, my girlfriend at the time bought me a pair for Christmas. Um, and I was like, what, like how many hours did you have to work to get <laughs> these? You know, yeah. like, uh, you know, these are all like, you know, we're, we're like servers or waiters totally. or whatever, you know, it's so funny. Wow. And you're like, but, um, so, uh, that'd be a better question for her. Yeah, exactly. That was initial. It was just kind of like the, it, where I grew up specifically. I mean, everybody had them and that it was the, um, it was kind of like if what's amazing about these lifestyle brands is that you, you get kind of people to, to it's the word of mouth thing and, and the 
uh, it's the brand kind of transcends the product as far as, you know, you see people, it was like, if you were a fisherman, like you could identify a fisherman by what glasses he wore, right? Like, or, or she. And so you see somebody wearing Costas and it's like an instant connection and you're like, Oh, that person definitely fishes. And gotcha. so it was just kind of like what you did. I mean, you, you, we, we always joke about it. It's like, you have, you have people paying, you know, $10 for a decal to put on their truck to market for you. You know, they pay the, you know, they're like paying us to like fly the flag, you know? So it's crazy. And so that's kind of the thing. It was like a lifestyle play, right? Like that was, you know, we knew they had it was arguably the best product, you know, especially with like as a teenager, like, you know, everybody's wearing Costas, all the captain's guides, anybody you see um, in my hometown. And so you're like, okay, well, yeah, it, it becomes a point where you like go shop for glasses and you don't even consider anything else other than Costa. And, and I'm sure in some other areas that, that brand it's another brand for that those areas you know and that's fine but it's just kind of the way it goes right and like a cooler right you're like well you know i'm not even really shop around i know i want to get you like that's yeah no i hear you i think the lifestyle i think you're nailing it on the head with the you know the lifestyle brand or whatever so if you think about some other company that say is a let's go back to i mean the rod is more specific but other products i mean can you be uh can any company be a lifestyle type company or is this specific to more general type categories yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it can and it can. It depends on the reach too, right? So you have like, um, I think G. Loomis has done a really good job of of kind of making that connection with, with the consumer um, and kind of like telling the story through pros and ambassadors' eyes, which is neat. So it kind of like, you have a little bit more of a connection there. But at the end of the day, I mean, that's the thing, right? So if you see a Yeti sticker or a Costa C or I'm trying to think of other brands out there, like a sticker on a, a, a trucker boat, you kind of like know what it is. And then like, it depends on the brand, I guess, depth and breadth, if you will. Cause you think about like Loomis, right? Like people don't know what a, what G Loomis is unless you fish probably and sight see that decal. They're like, what's that? You know? And so, and that, and that can go through multiple products. Like, you know, it's, it's kind of, I don't know. That's a, that's a tricky one. I think, I think you can build that, but I think some things are, some products lend themselves more to it than others. And Yeti has become, I mean, obviously Yeti has blown up part of it, like you said, because of the storytelling and their, their marketing and stuff, but they're, but they are right. Would you say they're kind of a lifestyle brand? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You, and I think the key to any of that is you take a everyday product that's not sexy and you build a following around it. Can you imagine, like, you think about, I don't know, current day or five years ago, like, would you imagine somebody, like, slapping a Coleman sticker or a uh, Igloo sticker on their truck and that being a cool thing to have, you know? And that's the same thing you think about Costa or whatever. Like, I don't, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. You see that Costa C and it kind of, like, resonates. And it's a product that you use day in and day out, right? So, you, like, most people don't leave home without their sunglasses. So, it's always front of mind. Um, and then you can identify other people by way of it. Um, so you're like, Hey, that person probably likes the water cause they're wearing those glasses or probably fishes or whatever it may be. Exactly. So, yep. um, yeah, you just kind of have to build that following and yeah, no, it's interesting because I I've seen it and we've had a few, you know, we obviously 90% of our podcasts are fly fishing focused, but we've done a few that have been kind of, you know, like this, this is not specifically fly fishing, but we had a, another cooler company, Canyon coolers on who does a yeah. Road of, yeah, road of molded. And mm -hmm. it's interesting because their market really, their target market is that, that rafting community. You know what I mean? Like they're really focused on building products for that. And they're different than Yeti. I think Yeti is a, you know, a little bit different, similar thing, but I, it was interesting hearing that conversation because it seems like, you know, Yeti's kind of dominating up at this level and then you got everybody else below. But it seems like there's still room to find your target market and double down on them and serve them. And then you could always grow, right, as you, as you get bigger. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing. I think you focus on – you don't want to take such a wide approach initially. So you got to dig in and make – you know, get planted and have some really deep roots in your whatever core community you're going after – and then kind of let let it spread and then welcome other people into the brand. And and so, you know, and that word of mouth, you know, kind of peace spreads that's like huge. wildfire. That's so that's, okay. that's huge for sure. And especially if they had a good experience with the brand, whether it be the product, customer service, you know, people always, people always say, and, and that's the thing, right? You have like, 
eight bad reviews for every one good one because people who have a good experience don't really like ask. they recommend it to their friends but they don't go online <laughs> and write reviews like i, th- I was joking That's with right. a buddy the other day about this i'm like i only buy stuff off of amazon if i read the reviews but i like rarely leave reviews you know even if it's great. <laughs> well, here's the tip for you and, uh, and everybody out there on reviews, like Amazon or wherever. But, you know, go in there. Don't read the five-star review. Don't read the one-star reviews. Read the three-star reviews. Yeah, those exactly. Are the, those are the ones yep. where people actually, you know, they have more of an opinion and they write. It's more, uh, yeah. So anyways, but I totally, I mean, the reviews, it's like this podcast is a good example. You know, I mean, sometimes you have to ask for the review and we do sometimes like right now, you know, so you go, go press pause and go leave a review if you're loving the show because, you know, those, those are the people, yeah, most exactly. people do love your product and, right. and, you know, but most of those people don't leave a review and it helps. It helps. Yep. It helps. But yep. okay, exactly. cool. Well, we've been uh, sure. definitely nerding out yeah. on this marketing stuff, so I'll have to hold this till maybe we can get you on another show if that works out. But I'm just curious on the captains uh, for clean water. We noted this at the start. Uh, Steve uh, Davis noted this when we did our Everglades piece. Um, just give us a little snippet of what that's about and what what your event was like. You guys attended. Yeah. So captains for clean water. Um, they were. Gosh, I'm trying to think. Found in 2015 or 16. I want to say and. Um, they were kind of, you know, started by uh, Chris Whitman and Daniel Andrews, who uh, were fishing guides at the time, who noticed a lot of water quality issues on the west coast of Florida and, um, you know, down into the Everglades. And so, you know, the, there's a lot of a lot of organizations um, who who weren't doing much about it. And so they're like, well, let's step in and do this. And, and you know, it seems crazy to try and take on Florida legislature and, and the government and all this stuff to try and kind of further their agenda. But they were able to uh, grow a huge following and kind of pull it off. And, and it's, I mean, they've gotten so much passed and passed through. And, and so the, um, I mean, they're definitely on the right trajectory. I think they have 15 or 20 employees now, which is incredible. And so this, uh, this gala, um, it was called the Restore Gala this this past Friday, and they do it annually. Uh, but it's been had you know had to be postponed because of the COVID the last couple of years. But um, so it's their biggest like fundraising effort, and so which is it's super cool. And they have you know corporate sponsors, and, and Coast is one of them. Um, but we have you know people buy tickets to this event. It's a, a sit down dinner, um, kind of cocktail hour, a whole evening, and and basically people. The coolest thing about this is it kind of is a snowball effect. So they start off after dinner, um, you know, they talk about kind of some of their initiatives and, and people donating. And so, you know, I could get up and say, hey, you know, I grew up in Florida. I'd love to see things change. Um, you know, I don't have a lot of money, but uh, I'd like to donate $250 or something. And then you'll have somebody who kind of like that resonates with them. And they're like, man, I you know love to get a table donation. I mean, there's so many, the, well, the first one they did, I think they raised like 300 over 300 grand that wow. night. And so, wow. um, which is amazing. So it's like, and a lot of people go there, maybe not even, maybe not even expecting to donate. And then something somebody says really resonates with them and it kind of tugs on their heartstrings and they say, you know, I'm going to do this. And there was a lot of, a lot of big donations this year, which is awesome. And it's um, just kind of going around. It's kind of a, a open discussion about you know people's experience and and why they um want to want to fix the water quality issues fix the fishery um you know stuff that that kind of is near and dear to them and so it's really cool it kind of spreads like wildfire and and people who go there steve davis uh, like i noted he uh, i asked him i think in somewhere along the line what is the number one thing because i think that movement's been going on for like 20 years and i said asked him you know, what's stopping you guys right now from meeting, going all the way and just getting this, you know, this, the, the thing. And he said the number one thing is funding. You know, it's not the legislation is like he's it's bipartisan support and stuff. So it's really funding. So the more people that can you mm-hmm. guys. So the more we get that going, the better off. So just a heads up for anybody who wants to to connect with it. Clean uh, captains for clean water. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's kind of an organization you know, based out of Florida. And so there's a lot of takeaways you know we i hear questions too like well why should i you know why would i be interested in that if i don't live in florida because it, it kind of affects all water quality and it also can be replicated in other states so it's kind of like a, a success story for how uh things might be done elsewhere so it's kind of you know definitely intriguing in that regard that's it no that's exactly it. and i think that that's that that was another point that was made in that podcast is that 
Yeah, I mean, you know, you definitely can support that, but also support your local, whatever your local movement is, right? There's probably some conservation effort going on in your state or your, you know, your area. So that's a good way to get started on too and just learn about what's going on locally. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. And that's the thing. Yeah. And that's, a, there's so many organizations that you can go help and, and dig in and a lot of them make themselves known, but I'm sure there's, you know, similar organizations elsewhere uh, in, in your local home state and home waters that can, you know, make a difference. So uh, uh, just take us out here, Evan, uh, for Costa, you know, if we always like to ask you in the next year or whatever, anything new coming, any, any new glasses or movement, anything you guys have going, you want to highlight here? Man, so, uh, you know, it's funny. It's, sometimes we got to keep things under wraps for a little bit, but uh, we're going actually going down to uh, Baja next week to shoot a lot of stuff for our spring products. Oh, um, perfect. So we'll be having having some a handful of new frames coming out um, and then also uh, a good bit of new apparel as well. So, so we're excited about that. There you go. All right, Evan, we'll all send everybody out, uh, costadelmar.com, or they can connect with you, I guess, on uh, Instagram. Uh, it's, uh, what do you got? Evan Russ, right? Yep, that's right. All right, perfect. All right, Evan, hey, thanks for shedding a little bit of light on uh, glasses and choosing a pair and the Costa story. I think if we have more questions, we can probably just head over to the website, dig into that, and, and pick your brain a little more. If, if uh... Sure, yeah, and, and feel free to reach out on Instagram or you know, if you guys have any questions, happy to okay. happy to answer. But man, I, Dave, I can't thank you enough for having me on today. I had, had a good time, and it's fun to talk a little bit about the brand and marketing in general. And and hopefully, one of these days we'll get to fish together. Yeah, it sounds great. All right, Evan, we'll talk to you soon. All right, cool. Sounds good. Thanks. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links, everything else we covered today, head over to wetflyswing.com dot com slash two seven two two hundred and seventy two. Reminder, please click that subscribe button in your app of choice. If you get a chance today, uh, that'll get you reminded uh, next time our episode goes live. And that next episode is a good one. Uh, Tuesday, we've got a super massive episode with uh, Tim Landwer on smallmouth bass fishing. Tim not only wrote uh, the most impactful, one of the most impactful recent books on the species, but also produced what may be the easiest and most enjoyable episode of the year for me. This one is super smooth and super fun. Tim brings um, so many stories. Uh, just It was just awesome, awesome episode. So click that uh, subscribe button and you will get notified when that episode goes live. Love, uh, I'd love to hear from you, to hear if, uh, if you had a chance to listen to it. Just reach out to me, uh, Dave, at Wet Fly Swing, and give me a heads up. I'd love to hear if uh, you are interested in smallmouth or what other species you'd like me to dig into here. That's it. That's all I have for you today. Thanks for checking out the show and for sticking with us till the very end. I will see you on the flip side. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.